while we're trying to do something instead of just the the uh, race week videos and slamming the banner we finally got another slam so I thought we'd try to do different videos this year as your journey continues to change we're doing some experimental youtubing is what you're saying more you never go on podcast I'm not I don't listen to podcasts so I don't go on them because I don't listen to them and have no interest in them. Well, you get about a million podcast requests a week on your uh, Facebook page and your uh, Instagram and website. It's hard to get motivated to do something you're not into. So uh, I like YouTube. I figured I enjoy this, making videos. I figured we could. There's 17 cameras here. Am I supposed to look at <laughs> one of them or? No, it's just a conversation. <laughs> It's a so conversation do, out into the air. Into the air. All right. We're trying to do more of a conversation about your last... The, I mean, you haven't been race at your potential since when? When did you feel <coughs> like last? I've extracted maximum capacity out of myself at every race that I've done the last 14 years. So extracting what you have on the day is different than extracting your full capacity. And so I've never given in in a race. I have walked Kona five times, and those are some of the hardest races, and I've pushed myself the furthest in my entire life. They scarred me. And that's not my full potential, though. That's not. So if what you're into is just suffering, um, and you know who actually asked me that question one time at a race at Tri Battle was Jan Perdino. And he was like, you have to ask yourself, do you just like suffering? Because, you know what I mean? Peak performance and suffering are two different things, right? Of course, to have a peak performance, there will also be suffering. But just suffering for the sake of suffering, well, perhaps I did go down that pathway for quite a while. And so, um, is it self-sabotage? No, I don't think so. I think I've always made what I thought to be the right decision over the years. It's just, I don't know everything, and I've kind of been on my own at times, you know? And I'm probably a pretty persuasive person, and so you guys, I slowly am able to persuade you guys that this is the right decision to do. And then, then everybody gets on board with it, and then we go, and then we walk Kona, for instance. And I'm like, at the last Kona, I turned to you in the energy lab, and I was like, soak it in. This is the last time you ever see me in Kona. So, uh, you know, uh, time heals all wounds. Um, so to answer the question, certainly something has been missing. And what would I describe? What is the foundation of what has been missing? I would say a good support crew who really knows what they're talking about and uh, complete dedication to the craft. And I probably have been afraid to be completely dedicated because A, being completely dedicated is difficult. Um, literally, like it's time consuming. It stresses you in every direction to your limit. And then also um, it is like, if you fail, it's on you. You know what I mean? If you fully dedicate yourself to something and fail, then you will know forever that you just weren't good enough. And so there's also an element of fear to fully dedicating yourself to someone, to something. Yeah. And so um, I would say those have been problems. Without going into like, I don't know, we'll, we'll spend more of this on the race, but you finally have been like, I need to just train. <clears throat> I need to train. And you've told me this. You went 13 straight weeks of, I'm not going to go enter some random race. You were excited about the T100 race. You just, and you even had said you had FOMO, thought about racing, but you're like, no, it's time to focus. You're, you're, you're finally what? Because you're so polarizing in every direction and something you usually do, but it seems like this year you're more confident and you're like, I'm just gonna finally be a pro triathlete. I'm 36 years old. I'm acutely aware of that this is going to come to an end. It's gonna to come to an end. It already feels that way. Like it already feels like, wow. I've been doing this for 14 years. I turned professional over a decade ago. I did my first Ironman in 2010. Like, I can't do this forever. Sport, in fact, we're very 
fortunate that we can do this sport this long because if I was a swimmer or many, many sports, I, my career would be over right now. So, you know, messing around for four or five years in another sport, that, that, that would be, have been the end of your career. So first and foremost, I'm acutely aware that it's not going to be that long from now. It's going to feel like the blink of an eye that I will be sitting on the sidelines spectating and cheering guys on and I will no longer be able even if I did everything right it's the nature of sport I will no longer be able to compete at the top of the sport so it's both harsh and beautiful at the same time to be acutely aware of that and so <clears throat> being acutely aware of that uh, I got no time to mess around and so we took after Augusta 70.3 where I just I did not enjoy the feeling at the finish line I was like such mediocrity I felt and it was like I've done a lot of races and I don't want to do races just to finish the race there's nothing wrong with that I finished many races and I just feel that I have more to give I felt that I had more to give and that I just wasn't giving it I wasn't giving it my all and I was going to have regrets. And you never know when your last race is gonna be. So you should cultivate an attitude that this may very well be my last race. This Oceanside may very well be my last race. And so you can talk, talk and talk and talk, which I've done plenty of. Uh, but after Augusta, I was like, I, I can't talk anymore. I've got to act. And so I assembled uh, you know, I've been working and consulting and I was able to assemble a fantastic team of people around me. And this is my final commitment, my full and final commitment to this endeavor. You won't hear an excuse from me ever again for the rest of my, till I retire, because I took the time to assemble a great team around myself who I believe and who I trust. And so we did that. And we took an off season and then the program said to train for 13 straight weeks and there was very little down. I had a few downs due to illness and due to some traveling, but for the most part, I was very consistent for 13 weeks and I had five mental breakdowns in that time. They became less frequent. They were very frequent in the beginning because I had to adapt. It had been so long. Over the last five years, I've not really done consistent training. I've done like a few weeks training, then, you know, I do some crazy hero sessions, put myself in a body bag, need to take a few weeks to recover, maybe not even fully recover, then go to a race, then take time off after the race and blah, 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 and very little consistency. And so uh, this time though, it's the first time in a long time, really I would say since 2017, where I did some very consistent training, 13 straight weeks of it. And I knew that I couldn't have trained any more or any harder because I had a mental breakdown on the last session, last Saturday, one week ago, um, the final session before the taper, I had a complete mental breakdown and I quit in the middle of a workout and I soft pedaled back to the car and it was into an insane headwind and I'm pushing 150 watts and going like literally five miles an hour because the headwind was so insane. I just was like, <laughs> Couldn't get back to the car. And I got back to the car and I just absolutely flipped. I called Aaron and I, I'm talking, I flipped. And fortunately, you know, I had logged excellent training, consistent training, and Aaron knows me really well and uh, got me back in the game mentally. I tapered and I came here to Oceanside and rolled the dice. What is it? Is it insecurity, not putting down the results you wanted to the last year, racing the best guys, the sport evolved. What what makes you get to this race week and be like, because I know the day before the race, we were chatting and you were just like, oh my God, this is it. Many races over the last while, I've been apathetic. I've felt nothing and that's not good. That is not good. If you are going into major races, professional level racing, this is your career and you're on start lines, and the night before or the morning of, you feel nothing. You don't really feel excitement. You don't feel pumped up. You don't feel bad, but you also don't feel good. 
I can't think of any worse state to be in. So whatever the heck you've been doing, you better figure out something else because that is not a good state to be in. It's not the state that's going to take to win. So fortunately, this time I knew I had gotten it at least better because I have been an absolute nervous wreck. Like I went and racked my bike. I didn't put my stickers on my bike. I, like it didn't even occur to me to put stickers on the, you know, like if you don't do the spar, that wouldn't mean anything. But if you do the spar, like every bike's got stickers, how they identify your bike to get it in and out of transition, etc. And like, I didn't do that's such a very basic thing. I didn't even do it because I was just so scatterbrained. I was like five minutes late for the, the check-in because I was like just so out of it. And I was just nerves. And well, why are you nervous? Because you care. Because I devoted 13 weeks to this. Because my family sacrificed so much for me to do this. Because I devoted myself entirely to training. And Aaron and I had to have this conversation before we went down this 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 season. And the conversation was like, do I have the capacity to devote myself to this endeavor? And because without Aaron's help, that's 100% not possible. We have a little boy, we have a house, we have a little dog. The reality is triathlon, long distance, ultra triathlon that takes eight hours to do at extremely high intensity uh, is insanely time consuming. And the only way that you can compete now with the very top guys is to get on their level. And so what is the common theme between all of the top guys right now? They all train a lot and they all are insanely dedicated, almost like, like machine level dedication uh, to the craft. And so it was like, we had to have a long conversation about, can I, do I even have the capacity to do that anymore? Like, has, has it passed me by that ability to do that? When I was younger, I was also like that. I got in it at 22, 23 years old. And I was also, I had nothing. It was my, I was running away from like uh, addiction and negative things. I was running away as fast as I could. And so I threw myself into this and allowed it to completely engulf myself. But I'm not the same person as I was then. I'm a much different person now. And so that was the conversation that we had to have. And fortunately, Aaron uh, was like, I'm in. It's not forever. We're not doing this for like the next 50 years. <laughs> like it's a couple of, it's really, let's take it one season at a time. You know, at best, I have only a few more seasons. That's the reality of sport. But let's just take it one race and one season at a time. And so that was what the nervousness stemmed from is that we made this commitment together. And once again, like I said, when you fully dedicate yourself to something, if you fail, it means that you failed. <laughs> and sometimes like, I mean, we, I, I probably protected myself for five years, my ego, my, 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 my pride, et cetera, by not fully committing to the thing so that I didn't have to, I always had the excuse in the back pocket. Well, I could have done this. I could have done that. But then I, like I said, you become acutely aware that the end is near and you're like, do I really want to, at the end of this thing, say, if I'd only done that, if I'd only dedicated myself and so that's where the nervousness stemmed from. Well, it's like four or five minutes before the race. Paul Newby Frazier comes over, grabs you. Lionel, we need you over here for the broadcast. Get over here. And you're like straight killer mentality. And then you say goodbye to Aaron. And then you go over there and you stand with all those guys. What was going through your head? Um, finally. <laughs> finally. Now I can <laughs> just so you don't have to feel the nervousness and stuff anymore. I was actually like... It's a, it was the right place to be because, like I said, I'd been on start lines where I'm like, ah, whatever, whatever. But this time I'm like, finally, they're letting me out of the cage. And so I, I was excited. And I was like just in the right mindset in every way. Like Indian Wells two years ago or whatever it was where I had the like panic attack, you know, like this time the water's cold. I didn't even, I just, I just got in the water, dove straight in. I don't care. I, it's not a mental, that's not a block in my mind whatsoever. I couldn't care less with the water temperature. That water could have been 40 degrees. I couldn't care less. There's going to be no excuses out of me. There will be no panic attacks. There will be no excuses. There'll be nothing. I'm not going to be hypoxic when the gun goes. I'm not going to swim like shit. I'm not going to muscle the water. I'm going to do everything that I've trained to do and that I've learned over the years and I'm going to express it all right here and right now. And there'll be no excuses out of me. And so that's what I did. And so things went wrong, 
the the jet i told you i like i intended to take a morton 160 before so get 40 grams of carbs in before the swim because it's basically the warm-up plus the swim plus you know a little bit of time on the bike it's 45 minutes without eating anything which is not good like you want to be eating have stuff already carbohydrate going into the bloodstream and i forgot the gel and i feel the negative you know excuses come like oh well there's there's an excuse so why i didn't whatever fill in the blanks get that crap out of here i couldn't care less you've done a massive amount of training you're greatly fat adapted you don't need to take a carbohydrate gel before you'll be totally fine yeah you you had the best swim of your life walk us through getting over to the swim start where'd you position yourself and how'd the gun go well one of my weaknesses is the start speed and so i didn't want to be like in the middle of it because uh, I don't get out very well, and so I, I didn't want to be bogged down between, behind guys who potentially could get out quicker than me, but then I have a better threshold swim speed. So I took the risk of starting very far left with basically no one over on the side. I actually was, I think, only two guys to my left, so I was ba basically by myself. <clears throat> and that was a tactical decision just so that I was like, I feel confident that I can swim well without people. Like, of course, the drafting helps when you get on a good set of feet but I was confident that I could do the whole swim by myself and I would still have a respectable swim. And so I also knew that once we get two, 300 in, I can slowly start making my way to the buoy line and I'll be past the guys who maybe can take it out quicker than me and then bog down when they go beyond their capacity and blow up. And so I just get better actually, two, 300 in, I actually start probably swimming quicker than my takeout um and so that's what i did and i just gravitated to the middle slowly and by 400 i was right at the the buoy line and then it, it wasn't too bad considering it was 80 guys or whatever on the start line um it was a bit congested at times but you know you you, you assert yourself you hold your space usually i wouldn't be as i guess assertive but this time i was like there was a guy over on my left and i was like no that's my Usually I would pull like crap with my left when there's a guy on my left, but I'm like, no, that's my space, so, so get over. So I'm gonna pull right down the path that I need to pull. And, uh, and yeah, and so then I, I saw a, a, a colored cap. I knew that like the guys who had done the start, the top 10 or whatever, numbered guys, um, I knew that that would have been one of those guys. So it could have either been Sam, Joe, Lang, Jackson, uh, a few people. And so I saw that cap, maybe 1200 in, and I was like, well, that's a good sign. I'm at least with a, a top seed, you know? I didn't know how well I'd swam. I very well could have swam 26 minutes. Like it, when you're out there, you have no idea the perception of time. Mm -hmm. But I knew I was ahead of a lot of people. So, um, so that was good. And then I came out of the water and I heard names. When they called my name, I also heard names that I'd never heard before. Uh, and so, I knew that I had swam really well. So you run over to your bike. You didn't have the best transition. In fact, you swam about a minute faster than Sam, uh, which I mean, in probably one of your smallest ever deficits in a 70.3, probably your best ever. Um, a minute ahead of Sam, you fumbled around a transition. What happened in there? Um, rustiness just, just uh, goes. <laughs> if you stay, stay away from something, I was six months off racing. Uh, the way that I set my helmet up, uh, the, the, the clasp velcroed inside of the helmet. And so then when I tried to get it out, I was fumbling with it and I ripped the inside of the helmet, the padding out. And it was just whatever, 20 seconds I lost yeah. messing around with that. But that's, uh, it doesn't matter. It's part of the game. You, you know what I mean? You have, you have rusty transitions sometimes. It won't, my racing absence will not be as great uh, into the next one. So that won't happen again. <clears throat> didn't matter <clears throat> wasn't going to use that as an excuse hopped onto the bike just went to work immediately and i uh, got to the front of the group of people that i swam with uh, and then once again racing rustiness came along was rolling up on a group of guys at about 10k and they went straight the arrow said to go left and it just didn't have much reaction time went with them fortunately i'd saw the arrow to go left so i just immediately u-turned uh, came around, went back, but now I was at the back of the group that I had swam with. And so, uh, oh well, whatever, it's not an excuse. And then Sam now was with the group. 
And my goal for this one, I, was, <clears throat> I got dropped by him every single race last season. And that was the end of the race for me when he dropped me. And so I was like, at the very least, don't get dropped on the bike this time. That'll have been a victory. That will have been improvement. And unfortunately, he decided that this was going to be a very hard bike ride. And I took a few pulls and tried to bridge us up to the front. Uh, but then when we got there, Sam took over. And I mean, I'd love to have taken the lead, but he was not allowing that to happen because when we were going up the hills, I was pushing 430 and he was starting to pull away. So <clears throat> in order to have made a pass up the hill, I bet you I would have had to have done 550 watts to overcome him and get to the front. So it was like, okay, well, this is, he's gonna push the pace here. When, when did you hear your first time gap to Yell's group or the front group? Uh, well, out of the water, I was a minute, like a minute 38 down or something. So when I got out after that transition, I heard two minutes actually going onto the bike. So I lost about 20 seconds in transition due to the helmet thing. Um, and so then we had a, like there's an out and back section and then we saw a whole group of people at like a, a tunnel and we got a split there and they were like 40 seconds. So I knew, oh wow, we, we made up quite a bit of time in a short, that was only not even 15 miles or so. And so I knew we were, we were gonna catch the front for sure, which was definitely a question mark with such a big field going into it. Um, and then once we caught the front, I mean, that's what I said, Sam, Sam took charge and he didn't seem like he wanted to ride with anybody. <clears throat> but, you know, I, my goal was to not get dropped. And I knew if I got dropped that uh, that would be the end of the race. I just, I think Sam's a great front runner. And so if he gets out, out there alone, uh, you, I don't think you're going to run him down. And so uh, I, I was on the ropes for literally an hour. Every uphill, I was just like, no, not again. Because, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, like, this guy must be pushing, like, you know, I weigh a bit less than him and I was pushing 430. So like this guy must be pushing 450, 480 watts going up these hills for minutes on end and then crushing it on the other side. <clears throat> and so it was just like, mentally it was a real struggle. Uh, but I was like, are you really gonna lose on the bike? Wow, the race is over on the bike. And so I gambled and I did everything to hang on for dear life. And- Were you concerned about Yella? I was greatly concerned about Yella. Uh, he's a class, the highest class of runner in the game. And I, you know, with certainty he has the potential to run 107, 108. Uh, and so <clears throat> it's also after talking to Sam was why he said he was pushing the pace so hard. He didn't think that we had dropped him. And so he thought he was in the group of us. And so that's why he said he was pushing the pace so hard. And so I knew we had dropped him though. Um, so I didn't understand what was going on, but yeah, we got, we got to transition and I hadn't got dropped. I know Sam's a phenomenal transitioner. I I've in past races have rode with him the whole way and came off and he always gaps me in transition. I don't know if he put socks on or not, but I knew he was going to gap me cause I was putting socks on. And so he did. Then I think he got maybe 10 seconds on me out of transition. And then I was off with the whole, I think uh, four or five guys that we all rode together, Jackson and Justin really being uh, two of them. And so we all were basically shoulder to shoulder going out onto the run course. And then, I mean, 21K is a long way to go, especially after you've basically destroyed your legs from doing massive surges <laughs> up hills and i just stayed patient and you know i hadn't been running in the carbons very much so it was it was the pace felt very controlled and i just i just tried to stay within myself for as long as i could and then i knew i would get it uh, be able to get a a read on everyone at the first turnaround so i started to open up a gap that first 5k and then i got a I use breaths to understand how far or close people are. And so I think I was about 10 breaths at the turn ahead of Jackson and Sam. And I was 75 breaths ahead of Heli. And so, okay, great. Keep, keep working, keep working. I didn't, like I said, didn't wear, run with a watch on. And so then at the next turnaround, I was only like 
six breaths ahead of Sam. Jackson had opened, let a gap open a bit, but I was still 75 breaths ahead of Helen. And so I knew this was gonna be a race with Sam now, and he had pulled back time on me. This is halfway <clears throat> point. It's over half, actually. It's about seven miles. Uh, and so I was like, I've really got to push this because if he starts to make up time or feels like he can bridge the gap to me, then he's gonna be very, very hard to beat. Uh, and so then the race to me, for me was to the final turnaround, not to the finish line, because I was like, if I can get to that final turnaround, having put time into him, then he will not hunt me the final two miles. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be what happened. I, I extended from 20 seconds differential to about a minute differential by mile 11. <clears throat> and well, that was it. Now I didn't ease off the gas because I was, relishing the moment, relishing the suffering. You know, I'd worked hard for it. It had been since 2017 that I won Oceanside. What it take, took to win Oceanside 2017 was a lot less than what it took to win 2024 in every way. And so I just soaked it in to the best of my ability and part of soaking it in is pushing it to the finish line. And so it was, it was important for me to do that. The, the critics said your best races were behind you, and that's one of the reasons why you didn't do the T100 series as you can't compete at that level anymore. Did you think about any of that while you're racing? I'm, I'm, I'm still here. I'm back. Um, most definitely when, you, when you're not performing well over and over again, I don't care. We all believe in ourselves. You couldn't be... You couldn't be a professional if you didn't have some level of self-confidence and belief in yourself. So, so I believe in myself and I've always bet on myself, but you know, I'd be lying to say that I wasn't starting to doubt, wasn't starting a little bit to creep in there. And so for me, it was, it certainly was satisfying to, you know, reaffirm that, that self-confidence and then that belief that I have had just it had not been um i just hadn't been i think doing the things as well as i could as dedicated as i could to express my full potential so do i think that this oceanside 2024 performance is my peak for the season and you know i'm not going to be able to perform better no i i do truly believe that we're just going to get better every single race so was this it's one a of good... the best races of your career performances um i think it is maybe the one of the most meaningful performances of my career for sure numbers wise i've probably done very similar bike runs not with the swim that i had um, the feeling of it was good so it, it's up there for sure but i've have raced well over the years you know i have had good races i've tasted it and so but in terms of um how much I devoted to this, I would say it's it's certainly up there as one of the most meaningful. And you know, the the, the other one being Kona 2017 was a massively meaningful uh, experience for me. And and Jan here in 2015, most this I would say that would be my top three. This one, Kona 2017, and Oceanside 2015 are my most meaningful races. And Montchambon 2014. It was a uh, pretty emotional finish for you. And I don't think it was emotional the fact that you won, but it's the fact that you've had some rough couple years when you crossed the finish line and you finally got to see Aaron. What was that like? I wouldn't say I've had a rough couple years. I mean, I do, I do triathlon and they, they pay me to do it. And so like, is this rough? Uh, well, you better go check the definition of rough if, if that's the definition of rough. There's 3,000 people doing the race, of which I'm in the uh, 120 or so who are making money doing it. There, everyone else is paying to do the same thing. So uh, it hasn't been rough. Now, as an athlete, of course, you want to win and you want to perform at the highest of your capacity. And so rough from the standpoint that I hadn't performed to my potential and actually a little bit last season hitting my head against the wall saying, what's wrong? Like, what, what am I doing wrong? Which is why I kind of needed to take time to build a support team around myself of people whom I trust and 
uh, who I believe in so that they can help me. You can't achieve peak performance, I don't think, without a team. Like you, you need great people around you. You can't do it all yourself. You need great people around you. And so um, that, that, that was an extremely important thing that had to be done. And so, um, yeah, it, it was more of, I, I, to be honest, it was, it was relieving because I just wanted really to prove to Aaron that like this is not all, I won't say for nothing because we make a living doing it, but like we, we both want peak performance. We both want to achieve the, the peak, the, to see. I think Aaron believes in me and wants to see me and find out. We're, we're interested to find out what's, what's possible. And so one day, you know, I've always told Aaron, I'll repay the favor. Whatever you want to do in a couple of years' time, uh, I will, if you want to focus on something, I'll be your Sherpa, your caregiver. I don't have very good capacity. I, 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 I was the caregiver at the Havelina 100 for her and my mom, and I absolutely failed at that. So I don't know how good I'll be at that. But um, it was a relief. And I know it's not the world title. I know it's not the world championship. I know it's Oceanside. It's the first race of the season. But it was a relief to cross the finish line and see Aaron and the boy and say, we're on the right path now. We're doing it right. There's no need to change anything. We just keep, this is what I should have done in 2017. <laughs> 2017, I lost by two minutes and 27 seconds and changed the entire program. That was the wrong move. You should have just done everything a quarter percent better. <laughs> everything, the swim, the bike, the run, the nutrition, the training types, et cetera. And, and that would have been at least fighting for the victory in 2018 instead of throw it all out the window and start from scratch. So this was very affirming for both of us, I think, that we're on the right path, stick to it. It doesn't mean you're gonna win the world title. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that you're, you're on the path to your peak. And that's all I care to learn about is what is my peak? What is my full potential? So that I can say I did it. And so that, you know, I would like to work with people to achieve their peak one day. And what's next? Next, we will uh, go to the aquarium here. We are gonna do Legoland, but uh, little Levi is probably too small for the rides. So we'll go to the aquarium, which will be fun. And then we will hit the road tomorrow morning and back on the grind for three weeks, three and a half weeks. And then we have uh, St. George 70.3, which I'm excited to do because I love that race. One of my favorite on the circuit. I just love going to St. George. And then we'll take a little recovery. Hopefully we'll go to the wind tunnel with Canyon and do some more testing. And then I will start to big build into the Ironman and I intend to do Ironman Lake Placid. And are you gonna take part in the Ironman series? Um, I still yet to be the problem. The challenge is doing two Ironmans. We have to do three Ironmans to be competitive. And so I'm not sure if it's the right decision for me to do two Ironman. Obviously I've got to qualify for Kona. I'm not even qualified, but I intend to qualify at Lake Placid. So I'm not sure if it is the right decision for me to do two Ironmans before Kona. So with certainty, I'll have, uh, you know, well, not with certainty. I hope to have at least four races on my, <laughs> my record, but it won't be enough to contend for the Ironman series if I don't do uh, another Ironman. So we'll see. It's a work in progress right now. And uh, lastly, what do you have to say to all the fans <clears throat> out there that never stop believing in you, look up to you, call you every weekend for uh, call on you, your YouTube and all that for inspiration and all that? I appreciate you guys very much. And, um, you know, if you take anything from this, I hope it is that you persevere and just if you want something, and you believe in yourself, you just keep keep working at it. I mean, every single day, even if you don't achieve what you want to achieve, you certainly learn a lot of great lessons, a lot of things that you can take elsewhere in life. And so um, I've just learned so much about myself and about you know the ebb and flow of life and commitment to something over this last 14 year journey that it's, even if I don't achieve my dreams, it's still uh, been the absolute most amazing journey and so uh, just stick with it, stick with what you're doing. 
and see it through.